A rebellion that turned into a full-blooded civil war. Fighters in Mesrata taking on the army of Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. For months, the front lines had been locked down. But things started moving to the west. Rebel forces make rapid gains, advancing quickly towards their prize, Tripoli. Casualty numbers are high. The rebels have little training, and Gaddafi's forces fight hard. Supplies are also running short. But reinforcements from the Gulf states start to arrive, and NATO has control of the skies. The night of the 21st, jubilation. Fighters have reached the outskirts of Tripoli, and secret cells in the city rise up. In the rebel stronghold Benghazi, they think they've won. But have they? The sleeper cells in Tripoli can only hold out for so long. My name was on the list, I was on the wanted list. So you're going back to fight? Anything that I can be useful for my country, I'm willing to do. Three men have just crossed the border. They're trying to get to Tripoli. Muaz, Basset, Tarek. Finally, we're going back home. Brothers in arms. Thank you. Bye. Tripoli, inshallah. Bye-bye. I'm myself, I'm an engineer. I've never held a weapon in my life before. They're taking a road into the unknown. They've heard the uprising has started in Tripoli and they want to help. But they don't look like freedom fighters. With the flag of the rebel army trailing from their suburban saloon, they look like football fans heading for the big match. But this is no game. I wanted to join the rebels in uh, entering Bab al Azizia. I was willing to do anything and everything. I was prepared to sacrifice my life. These are the Nafusa mountains where the rebels started to push back. Using the protection of higher ground, their forces regrouped in May and June. In July, they moved down to the plains. And this time with NATO, they had vital air support. It's the month of Ramadan and they stop to break their fast after the sun sets. They share their meal at a checkpoint. As they eat, Muaz chats with the fighters. All of them are from different backgrounds, but now they're united by one cause. I was benefiting from Gaddafi's regime, but I mean, if everybody only thought about himself, then this is wrong. I mean, my people was not benefiting from Gaddafi's system. Then prayers. Gaddafi had suggested religious extremists were in the rebel ranks. Libya is known in the Arab world is one of the most uh, religious country, not in the extremes, but in a modern way. The Libyans are religious people, but it was not a religious war. Overhead, the flags flutter of nations who've held their fight. Nalut is the first destination on their route. This is a major base for the fighters who are heading in and out from the Tripoli road. There's a sense of urgency with all the military traffic, but the friends aren't quite sure how they fit in. With a borrowed rifle, they look like tourists posing for snacks. Then they move on into the night. They need to get to the town of Jadu, where they're planning to buy guns. The next day in Jadu, a group of young men from the capital are gripped in front of the TV. The situation in Tripoli looks dire. Osman moved away with his family. Now he watches live as his neighborhood burns. Another, Soliman, would learn later his uncle has been shot and killed. Across town, rebels bring a delivery for Moaz and his friends. 
The guns they'd arranged to pick up have arrived. The, this is the one, the AK-103. This is the Kalashnikov, and this is the F-10. These are assault rifles. This is what we are trying to get because uh, the rebels in Tripoli, they are short of them, and also they are short of RBG because uh, the, there is a lot of tanks from Gaddafi is rounding some areas of Tripoli, and the only way to get uh, to get rid of these tanks is by using the RBG. They look through and pick what they want. The heavier weapons will be delivered to Tripoli in a few days. Muaz is an experienced businessman, but he's never struck a deal like this before. It was so difficult. It was a really a tough day. Especially you don't have experience. You've never dealt with any arms or any guns before. The Jadu rebels give them a crash course, but these guys are pretty comfortable with guns. Under the Gaddafi regime, Weapons maintenance was part of the curriculum in high school. This is what we got for the road. It's a brand new one, it's a Russian mate. And I hope I don't use it against my people. Spirits are high. They're ready to set off on the road to Tripoli. The first leg of the journey is smooth, heading down from the mountains. The convoy moves at speed. Only supplies are heading for the front. Huge sandbanks appear on the road, protection for the rebels if they need to retreat. Roadblocks every few kilometers. The ferocity of the fighting is clear. One of the drivers is a Jadu rebel. He's been fighting for months along this road. Now he looks relaxed, but he knows the job's not done. What do you want to do to Gaddafi? Maybe kill him. Kill him? Yes, because uh, you kill many people in Libya, from Jadu, Sintan, from Tripoli. We pass through Zawir. They fought here for over a week. But victory was key to the advance on Tripoli. Burnt out buildings lined the route, others taken out by NATO airstrikes. They checked the route ahead. It's clear until Janzor on the outskirts. Outside the barracks of the Kamis Brigade, abandoned tanks have become a playground. Approaching Tripoli, there's a noticeable change. The convoy stops to prepare. Moaz looks tense but determined. Did he know what he was letting himself in for? No, honestly speaking, I had no idea what I was heading to. I mean, I just wanted to join uh, the rebels over there and free my country, Tripoli. <laughs> Everyone's shouting. No one knows what's going on. But they're close to their objective, the Gaddafi compound of Babel Azazir. At that moment, I loaded my gun. I had just one goal. I have to liberate Tripoli with my other brothers in arms. Fighters are rushing in and out of the city. A plume of black smoke marks their destination people on the streets urging them on. Tripoli is a city at war and out of control. The fight for Gaddafi's compound will be the key, but it's amazingly well fortified. His palace surrounded by at least three security walls. I expected that it will last for a couple of weeks. I mean, I expected that it will happen what happened in Musrata will happen in Tripoli as well. Outside Gaddafi's compound, the roundabout of Souk al Tala, madness reigns. Fighters racing in and out. Gaddafi's compound is ablaze, but the battle wasn't as long as they thought. The battle only lasted for six, seven hours, less than nine hours. They just ran away. Muaz has joined up with the fighters from inside. 
they've broken Gaddafi's hold on Tripoli for the first time in 42 years. We, are, we think, we are almost sure that we have taken control of Tripoli. First time, first time the Emperor Bablas is here. The heavy weapons continue to flash past, but casualties too. A young boy caught in the crossfire. <laughs> Medics treat him as best they can. They have few supplies. Moaz watches, thinking of his own young son. It's been a day of vicious fighting, but the rebels are cementing their control. Nearby, they meet some friends. This is Tarek's neighborhood. It's good to be back home. This is my friend, huh? Six months, and it meant no more. Gunfire. But now in celebration. A joyful expression of release. But a moment of reflection for Moaz. I feel happy, but at the same time, I'm a bit sad to see all this chaos and all these weapons in the street. I mean, uh, I'm a bit sad. The sun is setting and the streets of Tripoli will be dangerous tonight. Moaz is concerned. He's heard that there's fighting close to his apartment. It's too dangerous to go there now and Tarek wants to get home. The family's been waiting for the friends to arrive. There's clearly relief and joy. Fantastic, fabulous. How long since you've been home last? Six months. Six months. Six months, yeah. And yeah. you come home to a free Libya? Of course, of course, of course, free Libya. That's uh, no more Gaddafi. That's, there's no more uh, justice, uh, no more uh, fear, no more. Alhamdulillah, thanks God. Thanks God, thanks God. <laughs> Tarek's mother is overcome at seeing her son home safely. In these difficult times, everyone is welcomed inside. But Tarek's father thinks the hard times may soon be gone. For that, we hope that everything will be in order. And within a short time, maybe one year, two years, it will be another Libya. Sure. That night, Moaz and Tarek go out on a neighborhood patrol. They stop at a temporary prison. Housed in a kindergarten, the inmates are accused of being Gaddafi mercenaries. A Ukrainian, the rebels say, was a sniper. He came to Tripoli just two months. Other Africans from Niger and Chad. They say they're being treated well, but clearly they're scared. Tens of thousands of black Africans are being rounded up, many of them guilty only of illegal immigration. Yes, there was some confusion. It's very difficult to distinguish between if this is a mercenary guy or not, but the people they acted better be safe than be sorry. The next day, Moaz heads out. The roundabout at Sukal Talat is deserted. The fighting has moved on. The newly renamed Martyrs Square, once a symbol of the Gaddafi regime. Crowds are starting to gather, passions inflamed. A few shots ring out, but this is friendly fire. For Moaz, it all began here six months ago. It was on the 20th of uh, February. I came with all the Libyans, all the free Libyans. We, uh, we, we went out on civil demonstration and we, we, were, we came from, from that road. On that day, the protesters had no weapons. They were met with live rounds. He was shooting at us with this size of bullets. Moaz thinks this was the moment that Gaddafi was doomed. So it started with one or two person, then people start going out, going out. one, two, three, four, and and when they started using live uh, ammo against us, 
This is when everybody decided to go out. That night in February, Muaz lost several friends. Troops with heavy weapons on the streets and snipers. One of the snipers was hiding on that building and another one was here on top of this building. So we, there is a place here inside. We went hiding here. We went hiding here inside here. Are you um, confident now that the snipers are all gone? Uh, I'm not really very much confident that they have got rid of all of them. I'm sure there are some still left. I'm, uh, I'm but snipers sure are still a deadly presence all across Tripoli. <laughs> Moaz reaches his home, but the reunion is somber. <laughs> Anxious explanations of what has happened. His brother has been uh, killed yesterday. This isn't the joyous homecoming he'd expected. Even his young uh, daughter, she's been shot at the same time. The, shot the baby with... and, uh, and this is my brother, by the way. <laughs> the neighbors are assembled for a funeral. As they catch up, there's more bad news. Another friend from the neighborhood has been lost. He was shot as he came out of the mosque. His brothers sit in mourning. Eventually, Moaz is able to get into his apartment, the first time in months. As much as you left it? Yeah, yeah. Even nicer now, when I know that Gaddafi is gone and nobody will be knocking on my door. His son's room, who he's left behind in Tunis. My son will have a Canadian uh, passport, and then he will be recognized in the world uh, as a human being. I'm sorry to say that, but during Gaddafi, we were not, we were not treated as a human. After darkness falls, tracer fire shoots up into the sky. It's further away though. The fighting is moving out of Tripoli. When day breaks, things seem relatively calm. Freedom! But as Tarek points out, the Gaddafi family is trying to hang on. This is Mohammed Gaddafi car. They had fight at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, this one, the other car, yeah, they catch them. But with Gaddafi gone, who would take his place? In Benghazi, a transitional government lies in wait. Their leader, a former Gaddafi minister, but a man who inspires trust. Mr. Mustafa Abdelji was the only one during Gaddafi's uh, regime who stood and told him no. He was the only one. We are with him until the end of the line and we support him blindly. But is the capital yet safe? Some of the National Transitional Council have already moved here to the Corinthia Hotel. Members of the international press too. The fighters assigned to protect them see a threat. They think it's a sniper, but nobody seems to know. This is the biggest threat in Tripoli today. The only thing we were scared of was the... We had only the threat of snipers. It was very, very serious. Everyone else takes cover. Journalists try to get back to the safety of the hotel. Someone standing and uh, shooting. Suddenly more shots. Everyone takes cover again. No, no, go, go. 
They're all on edge. Reinforcements arrive. No one knows what's going on. Then they spot something. Wild shooting. Hundreds of rounds fly into the air. And a pause. God is great, shout the rebels. Their battle cry. And as quickly as it started, the threat appears to be gone. Uh, we, have, we have some uh, mercenaries and come and fire on us and uh, run away. Don't worry, everything under control. Over the coming days, rebel fighters solidify their hold over Tripoli. As they advance, pro-Gaddafi forces put up little resistance and flee. Some attempt to escape to the south, but the rebels have surrounded the capital with a ring of steel. In their wake, evidence of horrendous atrocities. At several locations, mass graves are discovered. Do you know why your brother was killed? He's just a normal citizen. Eleven days after the fighters first entered Tripoli, it's the end of Ramadan, the period of self-sacrifice. Thousands come to Martyr's Square to mark the festival of Eid. It's a moment of collective mourning and reflection. We have fought, we have sacrificed. A lot of our children are killed in this war. Get rid of Gaddafi's regime and my people, uh, they will never be scared again. And you can feel that in the assembled crowd. For the first time in 42 years, Gaddafi has gone. Friends and brothers in arms reunited after six months of war. As the crowd finds its voice, the mood changes to joy. This is Tripoli's declaration of victory. Gaddafi's secure compound, Babel Azazir, is now open to all. Crowds of Libyans have come to see what was forbidden for so long. The fighting has left the building a bare shell. But one Libyans are proud to claim as their own. This is the rubble of Libyans. We are all equal. We are all Libyans. We are one, fa one big family. And the chance for a fresh start. The world saw Libya from only Gaddafi's point of view. I mean, now they have to see us through us, the true Libyans. For Moaz, it's the end of a journey that began six months before. The fight to get here has been long and bitter. Friends lost on the way. He knows he's been lucky, and it was a price that had to be paid. I consider myself, I mean, as personally, as Moaz, I really didn't pay a lot. Just losing my business, losing the money of my company, this is nothing. But 
I consider losing 50,000 Libyans, this is a heavy price, but we, we had to pay this price. It's not easy to get rid of Gaddafi and his regime, and I was willing to sacrifice myself, my family, my son, everybody. I mean, we were willing to sacrifice our lives, our souls for, for our freedom, through, for our new Libya. A few weeks later, Moaz is back with his wife and son in Tunisia. In Tripoli, there are still shortages and the water supply is being cut by retreating Gaddafi loyalists. But he's optimistic. I'm talking with my friends and my brother in Libya every day in Tripoli, and it's, they tell me every day is better than yesterday. He will take the family back, but not yet. This time, he's going to take his time going home.